the sermon that I've entitled today, the sermon that I've entitled is called Built for This. Can we say it together, I'm built for this? Can you say it like if you had some breakfast this morning? I'm built for this. Amen. You know, the, the Ford Company in 1988, I believe it was, the Ford Motor Company spent over $10 million. Check this out. The Ford Motor Company spent over $10 million in 1988. $10 million is a lot of money in 1988. It's a lot of money today in 2020. $10 million to create the slogan, Built to Last. They also, for their trucks, then later on, they came up with the slogan, uh, Made Ford Tough, or Built Ford Truck. Built Ford Tough. You should know you're a Ford guy. Uh, so, Built Ford Tough. You know, why did they do this? They did this because the cars came with quality, the cars came with reliability, and the cars came with power. God is also telling us that he wants to give you a quality life, a life that you can be reliable and a life that you can be powerful. Amen? Amen. He doesn't just want you to go through the motions. He wants you to have a powerful life in Christ Jesus. And so I'm going to get right into the word because the word is the foundation of how you were built. You weren't built on worldly standards or popular opinion or what your friends or your family says, you were built on what God says who you are. One of the reasons why people have so many issues in defending themselves these days and why they got to prove this and prove that is because they don't know their identity in Christ Jesus. When you're rooted right and your foundation is deep, all of a sudden what happens is you become a man or a woman of valor, a man or a woman of kingdom, a man or a woman that's secure, that's confident, that's bold, and that's anchoring themselves in the great I am and in this book of books. Amen? So let us turn to Matthew 7, verse 24. Matthew 7, verse 24. This is a beautiful chapter if you ever want to read, because pretty much three quarters and a half of it is all Jesus speaking. So, I mean, you may not like this pastor, you may not like me, you may not like another pastor or whatever, but when it comes to this chapter, it has to do with what Jesus has to say. And if you don't like what he has to say, uh, I feel real sorry for you. But Jesus said in verse 24 of chapter 7 of Matthew, he said this, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings, like meaning his preachings, of mine and does them. Can we say does them? In other words, it doesn't just hears them, but does them. Because there's a difference between hearing the word, like you're hearing right now. Those of you that are watching on the, on the online and hearing me on the radio, you're hearing the word, but there's a difference in doing the word. Would you agree? Would you agree? Okay, so therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, does them. It's not just hears them, but does them. I will liken him or her to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew. In other words, there's storms, hurricanes. And beat the heck out of the house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Solid rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them. In other words, you're constantly hearing the word, but you don't apply the word. So you're hearing them. You're, you're, you're constantly, ah, well, let me just do it my way. And you're hearing the word, but not doing them. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes or a Pharisee. So this beautiful passage right here indicates to me or shows me when I was reading it over and over yesterday that for the most part, 
For the most, not for the most part, for every part. I think every human being that's born, everybody that's born, they pretty much want success. They pretty much want to have a good family. They pretty much want to be having a good job. And nobody ever envisioned themselves living under the bridge addicted to drugs. Nobody ever envisioned themselves being divorced five times. Nobody ever envisioned themselves this. Nobody ever gets married to get divorced a month later. Nobody ever uh, does this and eats however they want to eat, and then later on they suffer uh, diseases and sicknesses and stuff. Nobody ever does things with the expectation of failure. Everybody wants to be wise, would you agree? Everybody wants to be successful, would you agree? Everyone wants to have the fruit on the tree, would you agree? Everyone wants the, the good things of life, and these two men were no different. They both wanted the same thing. And in this passage, let us compare. Let us compare these two men. This is like us, by the way. These two men in chapter 7, they both had a dream, and they both wanted to have a house. A house in this case, by the way, when I'm talking about building a house, it could also mean building a family. When I'm talking about building a house, it could also mean building your personal life. When the scripture talks about building a house, it could also mean even building a career. Or even for those that are going to be pastors one day, building a ministry, uh, building a healthy life, being successful. The, we all want that. I think there's nobody here that's going to raise their hand and say, no, pastor, I just wanted a fair life. No, I think we all wanted uh, a good life. I, nobody here is going to raise their hand and say, pastor, I want a wasted life. No, nobody's going to ever say that. Everybody wants a good life. Certainly not a destructive life. Certainly not a confusion life. Certainly not a life of an underachiever. Certainly not a life that's not rooted in the great I am. We all desire to be appreciated. We all desire to be significant. We all desire to be loved, respected, and we all desire to be successful. But not everybody is going to be successful. And I'm not talking about just financially or career-wise or family-wise. I'm talking about successful, meaning being in the will of God, prospering while you're in the will of God, and staying there for the rest of your life. That's successful. Because most families don't desire to live in conflict. Most families don't desire their children later on to get prematurely pregnant or addicted to drugs or crazy out there with drugs and alcohol and whatnot. No ministry. And we had 400, 422 Churches that closed down in America in November alone. No pastor ever signed up to say, you know what? I'm going to be a minister and I'm going to die 90 years old preaching the word of God. No ministry ever envisions themselves shrinking or being in total disarray. We're all trying to sustain the ministry and we're all trying to make a living in this little thing called life. So... We have the White House, of course. We have Congress. But yet we're living in a world that's divided and dissolving. And it's unfortunate. The, these two men, if I continue reading here, in, or if I just like tap into it a little bit. If you notice that it says, these two men heard the word. In other words, it's safe to assume or proclaim that they both went to Bible churches. You guys are thinking too much. These two men were men that both were hearing the word. Because it says here, they were hearing the word. They're, both men were hearing the word. Let me, back then, there was no such thing as Christians. We we're just followers or disciples of Jesus Christ. The word Christian was not out in the Bible yet. But it's safe to say that these two men, in today's standard of 2020, you may call them Christians. These two men also faced the same storms. They had tribulations like we do. 
They have troubles like we do, because Jesus even promised us trouble. In this world, you will have trouble, but rest assured, I have conquered the world. So it's okay. When troubles come, it's okay. It's expected. I don't even get surprised anymore. I don't even get flustered anymore. Okay, this is just part of life. I accept it. But I know one thing, that he's with me in the middle of the storm. He's with me in the troubles. He's with me in the tribulations. He's, he's with me wherever I go. And so life reigns on the non-believer and it reigns in the believer. There's challenges for the Christian, and there's challenges for the non-Christian. It's who and in what are you going to form your foundation? Because let me tell you something. Storms will find you. How many of you, this week, you went to the mailbox, and you went in there, and you were pulling out your mail and stuff, you had Christmas cards, you had whatever, and some of the cards, and some of the mail that you got didn't even had your name. It just said, current resident. I'm like, why are these people sending me this? Current resident, uh, to whom I may make concern. You know, storms will find you, and so will junk mail. It's a part of life. But these two men have a lot, had a lot of things in common, but there was one thing, can we say one thing, that made one a fool, and the other one wise. One was building on rock. And the other one was building on sand. Their foundation. That's it. They're both could be equally intelligent. But one was called a fool. And the other one was called wise. Because of the simple word foundation. That word is something else. Foundation. A foundation is always where you start a building. When you're about to build a building, you start in the foundation. You don't put up doors, windows, and roofs without digging the holes deep. And if you go to downtown Miami, Brickell, or Key Biscayne, or whatever, and you're going down there, the deeper the hole, the higher the building. The shallower the hole, the not so deep or not so high building. Average building, average hole. Deep hole, the tall building. And God is saying, how high do you want to rise? This is a ministry of not just, you know, patting your back and go on and just come as you are and leave as you are. No, come as you are, but leave, change and transform. Keep evolving. Keep changing. Keep rising higher. Amen. And so if we go to Key Biscayne this week, don't stop traffic trying to look at the holes. But just know that you start the foundation first in how deep you go. And these two men also had a major character difference. One took shortcuts and the other one didn't. How many of you know that life has no shortcuts? I mean, you can probably, you know, like, like I was telling some of the workers who were working here, like four of us, yesterday, Friday, Thursday, it seems like I'm always here. This is like my second home. But the thing about it is we're working and all of a sudden I'm like, no shortcuts, no marañas, no, no, no uh, uh, like, you know, what do you call it? Uh, rigged work. We're going to put excellence into this house. And if it costs a little more, so be it. But we're going to be built to last. We're going to build for this. Amen. So these two men had character differences. One was, uh, took shortcuts and the other one didn't. One of them was grounded on spiritual truths with life's reality and decisions. And the other one just did whatever he wanted to do. One was called a fool. The other one was called wise. A, a fool is basically this. A fool is a person that hears and knows what to do, but chooses to do otherwise. In other words, they don't apply or they have a failure to apply spiritual truth to their life's reality. That's what a fool is all about. Or better yet, they choose to reject spiritual truths to their life decisions. 
I used to be a fool making decisions based on emotion and impulse and whatever, whereas now I, yeah, obviously nobody's perfect, but I, I choose to always acknowledge God in all my decisions. And I ask God, Lord, if it's not in your will, and if the foundation is off, don't make me make that decision. Guide me into another path and lead me into more wiser decision making. So in other words, if you want to build a family, you want to build a ministry, you want to build your 401k, your stocks, whatever. if you want to build your body, whatever you're going to do, just remember one thing. The grind don't stop. The grind don't stop. I mean, I used to have the mentality, and this is why I don't get flustered anymore with things, because I used to get the mentality, oh, when is this going to get perfect? When is this going to be all right? Jesus promised trouble. Jesus promised tribulations. He promised storms. We're supposed to resist. We're supposed to dig deep. And so I have to understand that life is a grind if I want to keep rising higher. Life is a grind. It's not just like, oh, let me just take a shortcut and relax and be easy. Let it all be easy. No, that's not what Jesus wants. That's what you want. It's not about being comfortable. If you are building an easy if you are building uncomfortable, if you choose to be silent when you're supposed to speak up, you are not built to last. But I want you to, I want to encourage you this morning and say, we are all here built for this. Built for what, Pastor, may you say? We're built for the times that we're dealing with right now. We're, de- we're, we're built to last. We're built for this. Built for this what, Pastor? We're built for the For dealing with this pandemic, for this confusion, for this havoc, for this chaos, for all these uh, things that we don't know who's going to be the president in January. Well, we don't know any of these things. We don't know if Jesus is coming next month, next year, in five years. We don't know if our children are going to come to Christ or not. We don't know. But I want to, to encourage you with one thing. Whatever storm you're dealing with, whatever tribulation you're dealing with, whatever trouble you're dealing with, you are built for this. You got what it takes. Why? Because greater is he who's in you than he that is in the world. Why? Because you are more than a conqueror. Why? Because you are an overcomer. What does the Bible say you are? You are more than an overcomer. You are built for this. You are what God says you are. Not what your people or your, your, your posses think who you are. You are built for this. You're dealing with a lot of stuff. You're praying for your children who are all jacked up and messed up. You're you're praying for your marriage. You're praying for your financial situation. You're praying for all these things. And you're kind of like overwhelmed sometimes. And you don't know where you're going. But I'm here to let you know you are built for this. You got what it takes. You got what it takes. Why? Because you hopefully are building yourself on the solid rock. On the solid rock. No sweat. No sweat. No grind. You can't rise higher. It's part of the process. So if you want to go high. As God wants to take you. You build on the rock of your salvation. Can somebody say amen? Because I know we all want to go higher. But you're not going to go higher with sand. You're not going to go higher with worldly opinions. You're not going to go higher with worldly standards. You're not going to go higher with your high IQ and high intelligence or opinions of us. You're going to go higher when your foundation is rooted deep on the great I am, the solid rock. Amen. So let me continue with this story about these two men because I think it's fascinating. These two men started their foundation and they supposedly had no biblical knowledge. Some, some, some people have head knowledge, but they still look like a fool because the spirit of God is not totally in them. And they're, they're not sanctified in their soul and their, and their spirit. So you may have a lot of head knowledge, but that doesn't impress God. Even some of these priests that were scribes and stuff, they had head knowledge. But the spirit of the living God was not flowing from their bellies, producing uh, joy and peace. They had a spiritual deadness about it. And Jesus came down against the scribes and the Pharisees. They had a lot of head knowledge, information, 
but that he had the spirit of the living God living through them and in, in them and through them. Informational difference was that one, that one of them acted with God's full word and the other one said, nah, let me just do it this way. There's a difference between having head knowledge or biblical knowledge and having spiritual revelation. I'm going to say that again. There's a difference with having head knowledge, biblical information, and having spiritual revelation. Spiritual revelation and head knowledge, biblical knowledge, now you're talking. But I've seen people that are so spiritual, but they don't know the word of their life dependent on it. And I know people that know the word left and right, but their spirit is dead. So you got to have both spiritual revelation and biblical information to be effective in the kingdom of God. And one of them was rooted in both biblical information, Holy Spirit revelation, and the other one was not. The other one was rooted in their way, um, on life's way rather than God's way. And that's what we have the problem with today, that a lot of people, they start their foundation without putting this into the equation. And they're making decisions. Oh, Father, no, no, this is how they do it. Father, um, I think I'm going to make her my girlfriend. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this decision with my business. I think I'm going to expand over here with my warehouse. I'm gonna, uh, what do you think, Holy Spirit? And they wait. And then the Holy Spirit either confirms or tells or convicts them otherwise not to go there. But this is what people are doing. They jump on it. He's my boyfriend, Pastor. Pastor does the buckwheat. He's my boyfriend, Pastor. And I'm like, uh, uh, did you pray about it? Well, you know, like, it, it kind of just happened. Uh, you, you know, he, he's not a believer yet, but you know, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, he's not seeking God yet, but you know, I'm, I'm believing for a miracle. The miracle could happen because God can do all things, but now you're playing with fire. Amen. Now it's more the tendency will be him or her taking you more towards his side than you taking them to the yours. It's got to be a very strong and disciplined person to take him to you because darkness will always fight with the dark, with the light. Amen. Darkness will always fight with the light. So all of a sudden you're like, pastor, this is my boyfriend. Pastor, this is my girlfriend. Pastor, this, I made this decision. Did you pray about it? I'm praying about it now. No, 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 no. Not pray about, not, not, not make the decision, then pray. Pray, acknowledgement, then make the decision. And that's wisdom. That's called wisdom. And that's what's happening with people today. That they refuse to apply the fullness of God's word. And they don't start right. Issues that are, surf that are surfacing with family and relationships and stuff are not addressed because you don't have the right foundation. You rather listen. Many people would rather listen to God's word than do God's word. I'm stepping on some toes. I'm stepping on some toes. I'm some toes. I'm sorry. Ouch. <laughs> You're building your foundation on sand. If all you are is a great listener. You're not building your foundation on the solid rock if you're not doing what the word has you to do. God has programmed his word right here to work in you. It, it, he calls for this word to work in you. When, what, what, but you know when? Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Do you know when God, God's word starts working in you? Wow, I just got this revelation. Thank you, God. Do you know when God's word starts working in you? When there's movement by you. All five of you got it. When there's movement in you, God's miracle wonder working power comes into the picture. Moses had to stretch out the rod and all of a sudden the miracle came forth. Daniel had to pray and pray and pray. And he was, he was uh, taken care of while in the, Dan while in the um, uh, lion's den. David had to sling his rock. He had to have some type of movement to kill the giant. Nothing's going to happen if you're just a listener and you're not a doer. Nothing's going to happen if you're just a person that has no movement. God can't come to the picture when you're just listening, but you're not doing anything about it. Oh, Lord, help me. 
Nothing's going to happen. Daniel prayed. We did all these things. But God's work, God's power kicks in only in movement. Only in movement. Don't start your foundation with what man has to say. Don't start your foundation with self and then bring God into the mix. No, you start your foundation with God first. It's wise to get counseling, by the way, but God first, counseling second. Man's opinion second. So in other words, you dig deep. Let's say it with me. Dig deep with God. Then everything else after. You dig deep first with God. You act on that. And it will work out for your good. You keep doing what you got to do. Knowledge with power. What do I do in the meantime? Before that happens, appreciate where you are in your journey. Don't beat yourself up. Appreciate where you are in your journey. Even, child of God, if it's not where you want to be at the moment. Be content where you are in your journey. Don't beat your children up. Or speak death into their life just because they're not where they need to be. Be grateful, thankful, and content that God is doing a good thing in their life. Be content that something is happening even though you don't see it and even though you don't feel it. The word of God says that my word, when you spit it out or you talk about it, you share it, you testify, you witness. The Bible says in Isaiah, it will not come back void. So you could go to your children and share the word of God to them. And they may put a, they may put a poker face of like, and, but deep down inside, you don't know what's happening in their belly. You don't know what's happening in their psychic. You don't know what that word is going to do later on down the road when it has carried itself. You keep praying for them. You keep doing what you got to do. Sharing the word with love, with respect, and tact, and, and uh, gentleness. Because you can't go into a grown adult and try to talk to them like they're a 10-year-old kid. You talk to them with respect, with love, with gentleness, with, with tact. And later on, whether it's your marriage, whether it's your family, whether it's your children, whether it's your job, whether it's your health, whatever it is, you speak the word of God. The word of God will never say, oh, I'm done. I'm not going nowhere. No, the Bible confirms and promises us that the word of God will not come back void, no matter what kind of poker face or what kind of things they're doing. I'm just a messenger of my word. Of the, uh, uh, not my word. I'm just a messenger of God's word. My son, when I would share the word, uh, when he was all messed up and then 17 and 18, I would share the word. Oh, dad, don't talk to me about God. I'm tired of you talking to me about God. She used to share the word with me when I was in my work in the darkness times. The word will never come back dark. Void. Now, my son has no problem whatsoever. We sat down in the Virgin Islands for three hours talking about God, relationships, and God and his will. But when he was 17, 16, God, uh, Pastor, he doesn't call me pastor. Dad, yeah, can we not talk about God for a few minutes? I go, but son, this is what you need because you're about to enter some dangerous years. You might get married and you need to know how to put your foundation right because, uh, thank you again, Holy Spirit. You can't change the foundation when the storm comes. It's too late. You can't put hurricane shutters when you're in the middle of a hurricane. It's too late. Channel 7 News, Brian Norcos, whoever they are, they're like, hey, it's time to put on your shutters. Oh, it's too late. Don't put your shutters now. The hurricane is coming. It's too late. Once the hurricane has activated itself into your area, oh, my God, let's put on the shutters. Too late. You don't put foundational structures in the middle of a storm or a hurricane. You put foundational structures before the storm or the hurricane. You do that. It's wise, according to what Jesus said. It's wise to do so. But what's happening is, you'll, you'll know the person who's a wise man or a wise woman and a, a full woman and a full man by the way they handle life storms. Because let me tell you something. Whether you're in a storm Coming into a storm or getting out of a storm, 
we are all going to experience storms. And it's up to you in how your foundation is well rooted. When your foundation is well rooted, then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I got this because God is with me. I'm not surprised by what's happening because God is with me. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I'm good to go. You're not panicking. You're not on anxiety attacks because your foundation is rooted in the great I am. And nothing's going to shake you and nothing's going to move you. Amen. Say it with me. It's going to rain, Pastor. But I'm built for this. Ah! It's going to rain. They say it's going to rain, but I'll survive. Oh, you guys don't know that song. That's before your time. So you'll see the fool and the wise man by one of them controlling their emotions and one of them is consumed by them. The one that controls their emotions, and I'm not saying that you're going to lose, you know, you're going to lose it every now and then. We all do. But life will throw you storms. It's challenging. But you're built for this. You're built for this. And, you know, many corporations are going under during this pandemic. And like I mentioned, over 400 ministries went under in November of 2020. But can anybody tell me why corporations are going under these days? Not all at once. Don't blow me away. By one company, Amazon.com. Amazon, uh, just a little history about Amazon, for those of you who don't know. It began, I believe it was in the early 90s, 1993 or 94. Uh, Jeff Bezos was the founder, and he was the founder back then of a simple online bookstore. That's all it was. It, and, but he had a vision. He started in the garage, and the vision was an online bookstore in 1994. The shares, just for, for the record, the shares were $18 in 1994, and right now they're at $1,700 a share. I wish I would have bought some stocks back then. Uh, you probably wouldn't have seen me as a pastor, but God knows what he's doing. <laughs> but I'm just kidding. God called me for this. And he, he, didn't, he didn't give me the revelation to buy Amazon stock in 1994. But Jeff Bezos, right now, this founder of this online bookstore that began in 1994, the guy's net worth is $138 billion. He makes Donald Trump and Bill Gates look poor, just so you know how rich this guy is. But he started his company with this vision, and all of a sudden, Amazon took off. But some of these companies that were around before, they're now about to go under, Barnes & Noble, there's speculation that Target is going under. There's speculation that Macy's is going under. They've been around for like 100 years. Uh, Sears and Roebuck. Uh, all these companies are either partnering with Amazon or they're checking out. And it's projected. This is rumors that they're saying. I, I read it off this uh, Newsweek magazine. They said that even CVS... Rite Aid and Walgreens in five years to seven years are going to go under because everything is going to be owned by Amazon. Online shopping. There was a corporation back, in, uh, back then in, uh, in the 1950s, uh, 1959, they started, and then uh, I joined it. I was in it for like five years, the Amway Corporation. The Amway Corporation had the same theory, and then they went to a corporation called Quickstar. They just weren't built for it. But even though Amway Corporation, by the way, they own the Orlando Magic basketball team, so they're not so poor. The Amway Corporation also has an island in St. Thomas called Peter Island. The Amway Corporation went into this new transition called Quickstar, which means you can buy your stuff online and get it delivered. And so, but somehow Amazon was built better. And, and, and it just so happened to be. And now Amazon is like, you know, like... I never saw myself buying online as much. And now, I, where it used to be the norm for your, my wife and I to go to the stores to buy stuff, we buy everything online, pretty much. 
I mean, she still has to go to her store and get sometimes she has to feel. You know, but I, 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 I don't need that. I, I mean, I might, I might just, you know, go buy me a tie at a men's warehouse, which is right across the street. But I don't go to the malls anymore because Amazon.com was built for this times that we're dealing with right now. And Amazon is a, you know, it's funny. The other day we were ordering something and I think this is God's will. You're ordering something that says, order now for free shipping and deliver tomorrow. That's God's will, right? You got to be in prime. Uh, uh, prime, you got to be in prime Amazon. Order now, free shipping, get it delivered tomorrow. I'm like, my God. <laughs> Let me see a show of hands. I, I'm, I'm just curious. How many of you are Amazon Prime members? Raise your hand. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Wow. <laughs> I thought I was the only guy. But uh, why do I always think that I'm the only guy? Everybody's always ahead of me. But Amazon is now like off the chains with business and advantages and advancements that other stores do not do. They are built for the times of today. Like us, we are built for the times of today. And what, I, what, what comes to me is in ministry, God gave us people standards. He gave us special skills, callings. He made a covenant with his people, uh, a clear commission to go preach the gospel. There's goals, seek after God and, and the will of God. There's goals. And there's a message with his spirit to fulfill the, the, the presence of God and embrace his purpose. Now, a lot of churches are not built for the times like this because they're more focused on entertainment than they are on spiritual revelation and, and manifestation. We have not closed in 2020. And I'm proud to say that despite what came to us, we're built for this. We're built to last. Because not only are we bold and courageous following the lead of the Holy Spirit, but we're also allowing ourselves to, be, to build deeper and deeper and deeper to go as high as God wants to take us. I am going to do what I got to do to dig deeper and build our foundation, the Rise Up Family Foundation, the Church of God, the Kingdom of God, deep. So that we can go as high as God wants to take us. Because I know one thing. We're in the will of God. Because one thing is for sure. We are, we are not only in the will of God. We have had our most prosperous year in the seven years that we've been in ministry. So something is going right. So obviously it's safe to say that Rise Up Outreach Church is built for this. Amen. Thank you Holy Spirit and thank you God for providing to us. It's not about entertainment or God's presence. Is growth in the ministry and growth in your lives. Growth. Growth. And these companies with Amazon, they could not survive the wave of the world's culture. And let me tell you one thing, and I don't mean to be negative. We will not survive the wave of this culture if we anchor ourselves in sand. In things that have temporary value that are here today and gone tomorrow. For many, the word of God is not your identity. For many of you here watching in line and hearing me on the radio, this, the word of God, is not your identity. We start our foundation and everything else but the word of God. There's some religions out there that they form their foundation on culture and tradition and what the church has to say. That's not the foundation that God wants to start. That is not going to make it through the dark days. That's why a lot of those people, they, have to, they need an encounter with God and the Holy Spirit so that they can get out of that stinking thinking that has allowed them to live in, in uh, bondage and for them to thrive and prosper, endure, sustain during times like this. But we were built for this. Well, Pastor, I'm a Cuban. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm black, so the, the black church, the Cuban church, the Latino church, that's not the kingdom church. That's the culture church. That's the race church. That's not how God wants us to build. 
That's not how, he, he definitely doesn't want us to focus on the color or the race or the tradition. You know what that does? That brings division. It's not about black lives matter. It's all lives matter. I'm not, we all matter. Babies' lives matter. You know, people that are sick lives matter. You know, every life matters. But every time you bring something into the equation like that, you know what happens? It brings division. And, and, and that's not kingdom. Jesus was never about, well, since you're Jews, you got to be up here. And since you're Gentiles, you got to be. No, we're all one in Christ Jesus. We have to be built for the times that are coming according to what Jesus has to say. You know, when, when Jesus went to the temple, he would be praying and stuff. And then one day he went to the temple and then he left. And I guess he had like a revelation or something. And he went back to the temple. And after he had left the temple, people were selling money and transferring money and doing all kinds of things in the house of God. And Jesus lost it. He started turning tables. He started like, you know, like kicking people out of the church. My house will not be a house of, of, uh, of things as such. And he started rebuking the scribes that supposedly had all this head knowledge, but were not building on the rock of Jesus Christ. They were not building their foundation on the rock. They were building their foundation on culture and tradition. And when you build your rock on culture, tradition, race, the color of your skin or whatever, you are building on the wrong foundation. I, because if I were to build my rock, uh, my life on what my heritage had, I would be a disaster. I need and you need to build your rock on something that's constant, on something that's real, on something that will sustain, on something that will help you build for times as this. Christians are living today on what's called sandy rock. Let's put a little bit of sand and a, a little bit of rock. I'll take a little bit of the word and I'll bring a little bit of the world. A little bit of the word, a little bit of the world. And so now instead of you building on solid rock, you're building on sandy rock. Will that cause you to live a life that's built to last? No. It won't. It, it, when I say that you here today, watching me online and hearing me on the radio, when I say to you that you're built for this, I'm already assuming and I want you to know that you're built for this according to your decision, rather, whether you're going to build deep on the rock or whether you're going to be built on the sand. So when I'm saying that you're built for this, I'm already assuming that you're taking the right thinking and right believing position that you're going to be building on the rock of your salvation. Well, pastor, you know, I'm going to build right because of this. No, no, no. If you're not building on the rock of your salvation, you're not going anywhere. Jesus was on the boat with his disciples. And all of a sudden, Jesus, but before he was in the boat, what did Jesus say? Take me to the, the other side. He gave the words, we shall go to the other side. Jesus is saying, I'm going to take you to the other side. Jesus is saying, I got you. Don't worry about your job situation. I mean, you know, uh, be proactive. Send resumes while you're at it. But just know one thing. Jesus is going to take you to the other side. Yeah. But what happens is there's so many promises in the word of God. So many promises that indicate to you that he will take you to the other side. But all of a sudden, what happens? A storm comes. And when a storm comes... The promise that was given to you, all of a sudden you have memory lapse. You have amnesia and you forget that Jesus told you that he's going to take you to the other side. And so all of a sudden the storm comes, the hurricane comes, the winds are howling, the, the, the waters are raging. And you're like, oh my God, oh, oh, what's going to happen, pastor? Pastor, can you pray for me? I'm having an anxiety attack. Uh, pray yourself. You got the same God that I'm serving. Uh, pastor, I'm having a panic attack. Uh, listen, I can't pray for a hundred people every day. You know, you pray yourself too. Yeah. The storm is going to come. But Jesus has promised us that we're going to go to the other side. So if he promised you that, 
Will you believe it? Or will you just simply continue to do what you got to do in your strength, with your mind, and your IQ? That's not what God wants. He says he's going to take you to the other side. We, disciples acted, here's the thing. While they were in the boat, Jesus, what did he do? He started taking a nap. How many of you take naps in the afternoon? Okay, so do I. I take a 15-minute nap every day. It's healthy, by the way. Oh, pastor, I can't do it. Start doing it. <laughs> Set your clock for 15 minutes and wake up 15 minutes later. Now, I don't even need a clock. I wake up 15, 20 minutes later. But a nap is healthy according to standards and doctors and psychologists and whatnot. Anyway, so even if I'm in my car, I'll park somewhere in any parking lot. And I'll, oh, oh, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Yeah, you laugh, but it's healthy. It's healthy. But here's the thing. Uh, some people tell me, I can't take naps. Well, yeah, I learned that from Anthony Robbins. He says, take naps. They're healthy for you. It's kind of like, you know, reset and go forward stronger. And right after my nap, I'm like, oh, I'm ready again. I'm not digressing and losing steam. I'm gaining steam. And so naps are healthy, just FYI. Uh, but the disciples, here's the thing. Jesus was taking a nap. And the disciples went, not only a nap, they couldn't wake him up. Hey, Jesus, a storm is here. He wasn't even hearing them. They, they had to shake him. Jesus, we're going to perish. Oh, you of little faith. Didn't I say that we shall go to the other side? So he got up on top of the boat and he goes, he rebuked the winds and rebuked the waters and everything came calm again. The disciples acted. They acted. On what the storm was dictating. Not on what Jesus had said. And that's how some of us are doing and living. We're acting based on what life storms are doing. Not on what the word of God says. That he will take you to the other side. He will bless you. Because you're the head and not the tail. Above and not beneath. You, he has plans and purposes for you. To give you hope and a bright future. Do you believe in that or you're not? It's your call. It's your choice. It's your decision. And the reason why people get all flustered with petty things. Is they're not anchoring on the rock. And then the overwhelming storms of life causes them to shake or to have panic attack, anxiety attack, frustration, living in discontent. That's not what God wants. You're built for this because you're anchoring yourself and building deeper into the rock of your salvation. If you're not going to sustain, because a lot, this year, by the way, has been, the, I think, the number one year for suicides. Wow, up there in divorces, it's been one of the most horrendous years ever. Uh, but here, you know, life goes on. Some people are not built for this. And some people are like, oh my God, I lost my 401k. I lost my job. My wife left me. Oh, yeah. They're not built for it. No matter what storm comes and how hard the winds are howling and how the raging waters are, are raging, God said, you're built for this. Amen. You're built for this. Amen. You have to remind yourself. Because sometimes you don't have a mommy or a wife or, or a spouse to tell you, honey, everything is going to be all right. Sometimes you don't get that pep talk. Sometimes you're just going to have to be like David and encourage your own self. I've done this, and, I, and I, I'll open the door and make sure my wife is in the other room, and then I'll go back, I'll close the door. I'm built for this. I'm more than a conqueror. Today is going to be a great day. I'm, I'm, I'm more than a conqueror. Uh, I'm the head, not, not the tail, above, not beneath. Uh, you, you are a man of God. Uh, you're not perfect, but you are holy in his eyes because of the, what Jesus did in the cross. So I talk to myself like that. When the storms are a little, the boat's a little, how many of you get seasick when you're in a boat sometimes? I do. I got to take like three Dramamines before I go fishing. But, uh, but uh, uh, when I'm fishing, like I'm fishing. But if I don't prepare myself, if I don't build myself, then the storms will just overwhelm me and I will get seasick. We're built for this. Don't be shaken. You're built for this. Don't be moved. You're built for this. Don't panic. You're built for this. 
The storms that you're going to be experiencing, you know what they reveal? They reveal how deep you're rooted and how far you've built. I'll, I know, I, I don't have to know your life to know what comes out of your mouth. To know how deep you're rooted and how deep you have built. And in what you have built and in who you have built. The storms reveal our character. Everybody has a bad day whatever, and a good day. But the storms that are coming, whether you're in it or coming out of it or it's going to go, the storms reveal your character. So I don't know about you, but I'm encouraging you to fix your eyes on your only constant. Set your eyes on Jesus and wait for him to take you to the other side. But no matter, hey, I, like that movie, The Gladiator. You remember that movie, The Gladiator? Uh, Maximus, he's there, you know, and, and uh, they're getting, uh, they're, the gladiators are being butchered and they're being killed and whatnot. And all of a sudden, there are like a dozen of them. And all of a sudden, they want to bring in the tigers and, 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 the, and the, the schemes. And they want to kill all these gladiators. People are betting money on them. And, and all of a sudden, Maximus Aurelius, he says, hey, I don't know what's going to come out of those gates. And here is what I'm saying. And Pastor Alonzo says this. I don't know what's going to come out of those gates. Maximus Aurelius says, I don't know what's going to come out of those gates. But if we stay together... In one accord, with a spirit of unity, we will conquer. And I'm saying the same thing to Rise Up Outreach Church. We're built for this. If we stay together with a unified spirit and we conquer the giants and whatever the hell comes out of those gates. We got this. You're built for this. We're built for this. We're built for this. We're built for this. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but we're built for this. I don't know who's going to be president on January 20th, but we're built for this. I don't know if communism is coming, but we're built for this. I don't know how you're going to overcome life's changes and whatever storms are coming and, and whatever change you got to do and the loss of money that's possibly going to be taken out of you or the guns are going to be. I don't know what's coming, but I'm telling you one thing. If you anchor yourself deep, if you go deeper and you build deeper and your roots go deeper, you're built for this no matter what comes out. Of them. I don't care who's president. I know one thing. I know who's king. And the king of kings has the last word. So basically two answers or two foundation. God's answer, he has spoken. And everybody's answer. It's just like I tell people when we're in a debate. I've been writing some things in Facebook about you know, some of the lies in, in this certain religion. And some people are sending me inboxes. Thank you for this information. I'm sharing it with my, with my family. Thank you. And so nobody, only one person was like, uh, can we have coffee to, to talk about? No, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about kingdom. And if you have any questions, I'll answer them. But I don't want to talk about what you know. I want to share what I know. Kingdom, truth, absolute truth, not partial truth. Because you get the little water and you put a little urine in it. It's not absolute water anymore. Now it's contaminated water. I don't want contaminated water. I want the absolute truth. But, you know, when you're a leader, sometimes you're going to ruffle some feathers and you're going to step on some toes. Oh, well. Jesus was perfect. He did everything by the, by the perfect. He was crucified. Who are you? Who are me? Not to get a little flack in return. So, two answers. And when, when you're going into a debate with somebody, everybody's going to give you their opinion. And all of a sudden, these two words will just like rattle them a little bit. Who says? Do you, do, is that what you think? Or is, is that what this says? Every argument and debate in America boils down to two words. Who says? So when you're debating, who says? If it's opinion, who says? No, the word of God says, show me. Now, now, see, this is the final authority. If this is not the final authority... Then what happens is, well, you know, some other books were not put in there. Okay, they weren't put in there because the Holy Spirit didn't allow them to be put in there. But what happens to some people is, and, and uh, these religions, you know, uh, Mormons, Muslims, Catholics, Jehovah Witnesses, they use this, but then they add a little bit of church doctrine, Pope doctrine, this prophet doctrine, this uh, mind, uh, not mind, man-made 
doctrine. And they add to the mix, to the final authority, where the Bible says in Revelation 21, do not add or take away from the word of God. So they add, they, they add stuff that's not relevant. So now they're building on the wrong foundation. And that's why they may be big in numbers, but they're not big in spiritual revelation. They may be big in numbers, but what does God have to say about that? Because I don't know about you, but I live for the approval of one these days. Back then in my 20s, when I was a teenager, uh, what do you think? And what do you think? And I would get opinions from people, and I would get so confused, I didn't know what to do. And now all of a sudden, I'm like, wait a second, wait a second. We already have the answers. Why do I got to worry about what you think and what you have to say? I mean, sometimes, you know, you need to talk to people to, to help you see something that you have a blind spot to. And perhaps you're missing on something. And it's okay to, to ask, but you don't need to be moved and shaken when you're anchored in this. You don't need to be moved or shaken when you're anchored in that. And so... I have to say this before I continue. If you choose to conform to the patterns of this world without embracing this Christ wave building that you're supposed to do, you will either go the distance or you will not. And what I mean by going the distance is, oh, you may live 90 years. Fidel Castro did. But... How was his soul? Yeah, you may be even, <laughs> you may be even a Newsweek magazine for doing absolutely nothing. And by the way, don't be so impressed with that uh, uh, person of the year. Don't be so impressed with that. Even Hitler was person of the year in the 1940s Newsweek magazine. Don't be so impressed with that. Don't be so impressed with that. Uh, you know, be impressed with what God says. Don't be impressed what people say. Even this other guy, this Russian dictator, Stalin. Stalin. He was also on Newsweek magazine sometime. In, so, you know, these wicked people were on Newsweek magazine. Are you the child of God that he wants you to be is the question. And that's the most important thing. That's the most important thing. And so... If you choose to anchor up on the rock of your salvation, you will be built for this. No matter what comes or what goes. You can know for a fact that you were built for this if you're anchoring on that. If you're not, I don't know. I don't know if you're going to be able to be built for that. So rise up, family. Let me encourage you as I start closing. This ministry was built to last. I, I didn't... I didn't sign up or I didn't tell God, yes, Lord, I'm all in for you. When he was calling me in 20, 2010 and I was wrestling for it for a year and a half. And I'm like, whatever you got to do, you got to take away this from me. Uh, the real estate career that I was successful at. You got to take it away from me because uh, I can't leave that. I, I, don't, I don't have the power to do it. So you do what you got to do. And God did what he had to do. But may God be my witness. May, I, may he strike me dead that my prayers were do something about this. Close some doors. And take the passion away from me. Because all I want to do right now is be ambitious. But you know that if you're living with greed and ambitious ambition out of order. You're building your foundation on, the, on sand, not on the solid rock. There's nothing wrong with being ambition. There's something wrong with being greedy. But being ambition is part of it. But if being ambition is going to cause you to have your career... As an idol above Jesus, you're forming your foundation on sand. If you are ambition, okay, I want to be ambition. Uh, we invested in some stocks this week, or not stocks, some coins this week. And, you know, I'm ambition. I, I, I want to live comfortably. But Jesus will never take a back seat. Jesus will never be third priority, fourth priority. If time comes priority, Jesus will always be my first priority. It should be your first priority, especially for the times that we're going to be coming. Because it's going to get darker than this. It's going to get darker than this. But uh, if you're rooted deep, then you're built for this. If you're not, then you're going to have panic attacks. You're going to have to go to bed with Xanax. You're going to have to do things that are out of your norm. So rise up, family. 
We're not here to just be entertainers. We're here to help you build a life that will help you rise higher in the middle of the storms. Uh, if, if we have to turn some tables, so be it. But we're here to help you become disciples. Uh, Jesus helped Peter, James, John, Thomas, uh, all those disciples rise up to another level. That's what we're trying to do here at Rise Up. Uh, d don't, don't live so much on greed and ambition. Putting Jesus as a lower priority. Even the disciples told Jesus, because yeah, even, even this beautiful temple that we have, or this beautiful sanctuary that we have, church that we have, whatever you want to call it. People came in yesterday, and we were working, uh, not yesterday, Friday, and they're like, oh, pastor, what a beautiful church you have. They told the same thing to Jesus. But this is not my idol. This is just a gathering place to fellowship and congregate. Yeah, I, I don't focus on this and, and we don't collect three and four offerings to, to build this. The, the main thing is God and Jesus. And, and look what it says in God's word in Luke. Because the disciples were asking the same thing. They were like, hey, uh, look at this beautiful temple. And look what Jesus said. These things which you see, the days will come in which not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. We have a, a cross in the pulpit or in the altar area, but that doesn't make us a Christian. Can I take this tie off? It's so hot. You have, I have a cross. That doesn't make me a Christian. You see some of these people with crosses and stuff, that doesn't make them a Christian. I, I, I mean, the cross is good, but it doesn't make you a Christian. I can't take this off anyway, later. Rise up family. We were meant for the fires of the Holy Spirit, not just to quench the Holy Spirit. We were meant to have the Holy Spirit work in each and every one of our lives. We are not going to be a church that's going to quench the Holy Spirit like some of these churches have done. We're not going to allow that. We're going to allow the Holy Spirit to roam free as it should. You know, in December of last year, exactly one year ago, I was mentioning that 2020 will be the destiny decade. I started speaking life without knowing that COVID was coming. I saw the victory and I didn't care what was going to be involved in it. When you start speaking life, which is digging to deeper foundation, your roots go deeper. Now you're building on the rock. And I'm not talking about uh, saying words for my selfish reasons, but saying words out of scripture that bring life to the equation. I started saying, if you recall, this will be the beginning of the destiny decade. Remember that? I started saying that, not knowing that COVID was coming in February or March, whenever it came. And the thing about it is, when COVID came, I had people that were like, you know, hey, pastor, you're not going to open up, right? I'm like, yeah, why? I go, we'll protect ourselves. We'll wear our mask. We'll do what we got to do. Social distancing. But uh, Jesus said, congregate, fellowship, gather. He hasn't changed his mind. He hasn't changed his mind. So I remember one, one guy... It's a little, uh, don't confront me because uh, you got to come easy with me. You know, I'm a little soft. But this one guy comes up to me. He goes, uh, yeah, if you open up, consider us gone. Bye. I'm sorry again. Adios. And it hurt because I, I loved them. But, you know, they came up with this ultimatum. Don't, don't, put me, don't give me no ultimatums. You know, I, I don't serve you. I serve the king of kings. And... I made a decision that was controversial. I had three people on Facebook that deleted me because they thought I was crazy. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just kept working through me. But I always kept doing this. I, I'm not saying this to be arrogant because I was humble. I always kept saying, Holy Spirit, am I hearing right? Are you really causing us to build for this during this pandemic? Holy Spirit, if I'm wrong, please show me. Nothing. Go on, my child. You're doing just fine. Okay. Next week, we're going to open again. And, then, and we took one week at a time. 
Uh, with the threats that they were going to shut down, with the threats that, that churches, even, even there was uh, stuff that said churches are going to be closed down. I had a call in a, in a pastor's conference call with uh, the mayor. And I asked him point blank. He heard my voice. And I go, so let me get this clear. Churches are essential and we could gather. Yes. Then what's the reason for not gathering? And I, I had a couple of pastors, don't do that, sir. Don't do it. I go, where's your faith? Yeah. Pastor's calling me. Hey, don't do that. That's not, that's not right. Uh, hey, listen, you're putting a lot of people's lives in jeopardy. No, nobody has died. And all of a sudden, I, I just kept going by faith. I was built for this. And you're built for this. But the storms are going to come. And God not only honored and blessed and prospered, my decision, but he gave us the best year ever in the seven years that we've been. I was sharing with my wife that when we were in Salvation Army, the same thing happened. Yeah, we were prospering on Thursday night, and we're going to come back to this somehow, some way. And we were having discipleship classes. Uh, we had three months of 90 to 120 people on a Thursday night. And, and, and we were prospering. Afterwards, I would play basketball with the youths. The youths were coming. They were, we were all jiggy. And all of a sudden, Salvation Army said, Zoop, took the carpet from us and said, hey, I'm sorry. You guys are going to have to leave because we're selling. Oh, my God. But, Lord, you told me this was the place. The storm came. And I was rattled for a month. My mom would pass by the place and cry. And I'm like, Mom, don't cry because God has got something better for us. But I kept confessing life. Oh, yeah, yeah. mom, don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah, yeah. Speak life. Don't, don't go back to the past. Speak life. If God took it away, I didn't took it away. I'm in God's will. If God took it away, he's got something better. You're built for this no matter what storm comes. And I've been facing storms all my life. But I, I'm, I always go back to where I need to be. The root of everything which is the foundation of Jesus Christ. And as long as I come back to that, I'm going to be all right. I've been divorced. I've been laid off. I've been fired. I've lost my job. I, I've gone through everything pretty much. And God, and all I do is I just go back to the basics. <laughs> everything has worked out for the, my good. Thank God for his mercy. Everything will work out for your good. If your foundation is rooted in Christ Jesus. Can somebody say amen to that? Life will throw all kinds of you. All kinds of stuff at you. But keep rising up. Keep being unshakable. Keep being what Jesus wants you to do. For in 1 Corinthians. As I'm closing. This is my last verse. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. We will be tempted. Another word for temptation is. A storm is going to come. Things are going to happen. But know this, if your foundation is rooted, anchored, built on the rock, you will overcome that temptation. Uh, God will put an accountability partner in your life to help you. God is going to put a man or a woman of God in your life to help you overcome. He's going to give you the strength to resist. He's going to give you the strength to be more disciplined. He's going to give you the strength to make wise decisions. He's going to give you the strength to make wise choices. He's going to help you. And no matter what comes, I need you to say this with me. There's always a way out. And the Bible promises us this. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond. Oh, pastor, I can't deal with this. You're built for this. He will always give you a way out. We've all, I don't know about all, but I'm going to say just me. We've all been, at least I have, I've been in situations where I'm like, I have no idea how I'm going to get out of this. But God, but, and sometimes, and you know, this verse always came into mind. This verse always came when I got divorced. This verse came when my son's mother took my son to another state. This verse came when I got fired. This, because I had a difference of, uh, with stuff and, you know, the story. I went to jury duty and I didn't report back. If, but uh, uh, this, this, uh, 
This verse always came when I got diagnosed with Crohn's disease in 1995. This verse came when I've, comp- when I've gone through some of the storms in life. This storm came when my real estate career started going down because I asked God, Lord, fine, have your way after wrestling with it for a year and a half. This verse came when I found myself without a job. This verse came when I found myself without money. This verse came when I didn't know and I had to go back to mommy and daddy's house to, to rent for, for six months. This verse came when I felt overwhelmed, when the waters were above the boat, when the storms were, you couldn't even see in front of you. I don't know if you guys are fishermen out here or not, but I've gone fishing and scuba diving where we have gone and we can't even see five feet in front of us because we are in the middle of a storm and the rain is pouring and we're like, we're just going looking at the, at the navigating device taking it. Well, it says go straight, go straight. Yeah, but it doesn't look like we're going straight, but it says go straight, so go straight. And that's what Jesus is saying. Go straight, I got you. Go straight, I got the promises for you. Go straight, I'm with you. Go straight, go straight. And this verse will come to me when, I, when life raging storms and raging waters will come in my life that I felt overwhelmed. But I knew that sooner or later I was built for this and God's mercy was going to take over and he was going to take me to the other side. And this verse says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond. So whatever you're dealing with is not beyond. This means these two words is, uh, will not allow you to be tempted beyond. You know what it means? That you're built for it. That what you are able, but with the temptation, will always make the way of escape. That you may be able to bear it. You will be able to bear it. You are built to last. You are built for this. But here's the thing. Whatever you're dealing with, instead of impulsively jumping into a, a, a foolish decision or choice, know this. God will always give you a way out. That's the way out. You're fighting this temptation, but God is showing you the way out. He will always show you the way out. Whether you listen to it or not, He will always show you the way out, but it's up to you if you're going to take it or not. And it's easier. It's easier to make choices when you're rooted right in Christ Jesus. It's easier to make choices when you know what your purpose is. It's easier to make choices when your family's foundation is not rooted on what uh, the, the Joneses and the Escobars are, are all doing. No, you're rooted in the foundation of Jesus Christ. You, it's easier to make choices that are going to last because the storms will come you will see people panicking when they're not building on the right foundation. And so the challenge that we face today is that we need to return back to the foundations of the Bible. The foundations of the Bible unleashes a supernatural power in our lives. God is saying, I got a new beginning for you. It's not storming right now. There's no hurricane out on the horizon. Now is the time to build. Are you going to build on the sand? Or are you going to build on the rock? Don't call on me when the storm and hurricane comes. Now is the time. We're out of hurricane season. Now is the time to get your life together. And have a new beginning with Christ Jesus. And anchor up on the only constant in your life. And my question to you is, are we anchoring on God's foundation or are we anchoring on worldly foundation? Are we anchoring in our feelings or are we anchoring in our faith? Are we chasing feelings in worldly patterns or are we anchoring in the right foundation that's solid and no matter what comes, you will not be moved? No matter what comes out of those gates, we stay together and you build in the foundation of the solid rock we got this you're built for this thank you for joining us I pray and hope that tonight's message was well rooted in your soul you know 
This ministry has been given a God-given vision for our community right here in Miami. It's a vision that's going to be called Rise Up Outreach Center. That's going to be helping teens with their teenage issues. It's going to be helping relationships that are struggling, uh, people that are struggling with addictions, uh, all kinds of scenario. For more information, just visit our website right now. But what we need is your support for this vision. This vision is going to be costly. It's going to take a lot of manpower. It's going to require a lot of resources. And you know what? We need you. The gospel is free. But in order to advance it, requires resources. The kingdom of God, in order to be impacted further, requires people to step up and give. Requires people to step up and work. The information to give is right there on your screen. You can also go to the website under Donate and give through that channel as well. Thank you for your support. God bless you, and I'll see you next Thursday.